Good afternoon, everybody from uh, Miami. I'm uh, John Quelch, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and I'm delighted to uh, introduce our very special guest in today's uh, uh, Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits Distinguished Lecture Series uh, Fireside Chat. Uh, we have with us today uh, Mark Schneider, who is the uh, uh, global CEO of Nestle. Uh, welcome, Mark. It's a privilege to uh, have you joining us uh, uh, from Switzerland, I believe, correct? Yes, thanks for having me. I'm joining you from Switzerland on beautiful Lake Geneva. Right. Oh, well, listen, let, let's start there for a moment because it is an extraordinary thing that the largest uh, food company in the world uh, is from uh, Switzerland, a very small nation. Just give us a little bit of uh, history here. How did this happen? How has Nestle become so important to so many consumers worldwide? Yeah, and look, uh, it seems surprising at first glance, but uh, Switzerland is a super successful platform for multinational companies. So in addition to us, you find several other companies with market caps of several hundred billion uh, US dollars domiciled in Switzerland, uh, for example, uh, significant pharmaceutical companies such as Roche and Novartis. And um, I think what you see here is over decades, um, a very good platform for multinationals to be based, good place for expatriates to live, um, good infrastructure, good education. And I think that over time really attracted uh, a lot of talented people from the outside. Switzerland also has a long standing history on research and development. and um, what our company got started on is a piece of research and development that was applied. And that was essentially what is today infant formula and infant nutrition. And uh, that was in the 1860s. And then the company later on merged uh, with uh, an American started company in Switzerland called the Anglo-Swiss Condensed Milk Company. So this was a business that had essentially used some of the condensed milk uh, patents uh, in Europe. And um, the best source for milk uh, in Europe was Switzerland at the time. So dairy and dairy related products are really the past of the company. And then we started uh, you know, very early on uh, international expansion to all four corners of the world. We're covering to this day 187 markets. So I, I see behind you a, a string of corporate uh, logos, uh all part of the, the Nestle uh, family. Um, how, how do you, how do you, uh, it may seem an odd question, but how, how do you actually lead a company that is so vast uh, with so many, literally tens of thousands of people and uh, uh, as you say, in 187 countries, how do you lead something like that? Yeah, and look, the first word that comes to mind is humility. Uh, both on the inside and the outside of the company. Uh, I think more than ever, this is uh, absolutely warranted. Um, inside of the firm, I mean, no one wants an old style command and control type boss. Um, I think these days, if you want to be an attractive place for uh, top-notch talent, you have to be very approachable and, um, and let people be part of your thought process. And on the, on the outside, as the largest company in the industry, again, it's about being a constructive partner to our agricultural supply chains, uh, to uh, our retail partners around the world and, um, and being a good citizen in the countries where we do business. So, so I think that's a prerequisite. Uh, next one, as you can see from the, the vast number of different brands and categories we serve, you need to have a very decentralized structure. Um, I think if you're trying to micromanage all of this uh, top down, uh, you would just slow everything down. So you need to delegate authority. Um, have some pretty clear guidelines of uh, what people at various levels can and cannot do, but then let them also do their work and uh, trust their judgment and, uh, and follow uh, their guidance. Can, can you share with us maybe one or two uh, stories from your own leadership journey that really shaped your style and approach to leadership that uh, inform your actions every day the, in, the, in this new role? Yeah, look, uh, very early on, um, after graduating from business school in the 90s, um, I had a boss who was very happy with my work results. And uh, he was also quite a bit older than I was at the time. And he said, look, um, uh, one piece of advice, um, I couldn't be happy with your results, 
I'm not exactly sure I would want to be one of the people working for you because you don't give them enough breathing room. And, um, and I think he was spot on. Uh, and uh, different people have different ways of getting to sometimes the same result. Let them do it their way and be pretty sure about what you expect and when and, um, and clear about that and then also demand it. But uh, let people figure it out their own ways rather than insisting on your process, how you would approach something. Um, one of my favorite definitions of management is working with and through other people. And, um, and, and, and so unless you want to do everything on your own, you have to be prepared to accept some latitude and help people approach their jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, previously uh, you were CEO of another company, uh, Fresenius. Um, could you just uh, tell us a little bit about that experience, what you learned there and how it prepared you for the current role at Nestle and perhaps any contrasts uh, that you've had to deal with in terms of style or corporate culture uh, as you've adapted to the Nestle job? Yeah, so I had joined this previous company, which was a healthcare firm, uh, Fresenius, in 2001 as chief financial officer, and I became CEO in 2003, and then served there until 2016. Um, when, we, when I left, the company had about um, 30 billion revenues, um, and uh, Nestle at the time had 90 billion. And so one significant step up was simply how to cope with that vastly increased scale, uh, which means that you know, there's one or two more layers in almost everything you do. And still, you know, with those layers uh, to be able to get the job done uh, more or less in the same time frame as you would have done in a smaller firm. So this whole notion of, you know, staying effective and staying close to the facts in a large organization without turning to micromanagement, uh, that to me is one of these challenges uh, that we're facing in a big firm. With that previous firm, again, when I exited, it was about 30 billion in size. When I started, it was 7 billion in size. So I kind of grew through some of that uh, scaling, even with that firm. And I think that also prepared me pretty well and for taking that next step up uh, here as part of uh, running Nestle. What, what, what's your general uh, view of um, organic growth versus growth via acquisition? and particularly in a company like Nestle that has a very strong uh, corporate culture. And you know, I think it would be interesting to hear you talk about what the values are that glue Nestle together, but how do you balance the uh, organic growth versus the acquisition growth in, in your thinking? Yeah, John, I think that's a super important question. And even before you get to cultures, the one thing that was the same with my previous firm and Nestle now is if you want real interesting growth outcomes, you have to pursue both avenues. If it's just organic and everyone else around you sort of grows through mergers and acquisitions, uh, that can sometimes be a problem because people can get to a size where they can easily put you into second and third place. If you only do it with M&A um, and if you don't pay attention to the day-to-day -day organic growth, then um, you may be just trading firms, but whatever you have under your management may wither. And uh, to me, organic growth is super important. It shows you that uh, your products and services are in demand uh, with the consumers out there and they're willing to pay the right prices um, uh, for those products and services. But if you really want to turbocharge things, it's also important to look at the industry and uh, acquisition opportunities and building the company over time. So when the two comes together, uh, that to me is the sweet spot and that's what I'll try to focus on. You're absolutely right. Uh, culture is one of those key things to check for. Uh, too often, especially when you're buying out of auctions, uh, people really only pay attention to the deal terms, uh, but how a company fits, um, I think that is a very important factor to consider when you integrate the business. Sometimes when integrations go badly, um, 10, 15, 20 years after the acquisition, you can still tell who came from one side of the camp and who came from the other side of the camp. And that's never a good thing. Can you uh, just say a little bit more about what uh, the corporate values are at Nestle? Yeah. So I think um, it's important to realize that with both sides of the firm, the infant formula part and the condensed milk part, the origins were dealing with fragile 
agricultural communities around the world as we are buying our dairy and our other agricultural commodities. And so staying close to a farming community uh, was part of the DNA of a company from the beginning, because no matter whether you're talking dairy products or uh, chocolate or uh, coffee or some of our food products, it's always, you know, staying very close to that upstream side. And, you know, the farming community around the world is a very exposed community, um, uh, financially in some areas, very stressed, very much exposed to climate and the elements. Um, and um, so I think that taught the, the whole business a certain humility and staying close to the facts um, and, and also fostering long-term relationships with those communities. And um, being on the ground, being with them is a key part of that. Uh, so um, it's also evident when I look at before COVID, the travel schedule of our executives, um, people want to go see, they want to be with our business partners and, um, and close to where the action is, as opposed to judging the world from headquarters. Just to sneak a question in here, um, that, that's going to go back to where it was before, right? Your executives are going to be back on the road visiting uh, farms, visiting consumers uh, on the ground around the world. That will be back on, absolutely. I think without that, you will not be able to uh, judge uh, the whole business in its entirety. And just to give you an example, you know, I mean, I haven't been traveling now uh, in a major way for a year or so, but uh, before, every time I go and visit a market, even before we sit down and talk about the business and the strategy, there is my favorite part, and that is we go shopping. And uh, so we literally go to a number of retail outlets and see how the products are positioned. And I'm also trying to make sure it's not only carefully arranged outlets, but rather there's a bit of an element of chance here so that uh, I, I get to see uh, the real picture. And um, no matter whether you're talking about the sales and marketing side or the supply chain side, that whole notion of staying close to the sharp end of the business is very important to us. Would you agree that you can only successfully decentralize if you have a strong company culture? Absolutely. And I think that is, at the end, the kind of safety belt that keeps it together. Now, you will always have um, uh, behaviors that are non-compliant. And so I think you also need some formal structures like uh, audit and, uh, and uh, compliance hotlines and so forth. But a strong culture is, um, you know, a key element of glue inside a company. And um, I think this is something that really um, uh, impressed me uh, very much upon joining Nestle because you have a very strong cultural backbone. Um, but when, when I stepped into some of the induction meetings and people introduced themselves uh, around the room, you know, 10 years of 10, 20, 30 years uh, were pretty common. And uh, people know each other really well. And so for a company our size with about 300,000 people, it's the largest company I've ever seen that had a family feel to it, which, um, which I find really impressive. And the imagery I, I, I started to use is, is a company, a railway station, where you have lots of people in the same place, but everyone is going different places? Or is a company actually like a train where you're on, this, on the same train going to the same destination? And if you use that example, we're clearly qualifying as a train. I can imagine that in Switzerland, an on the time train analogy goes down pretty well. <laughs> okay. Goes better down than some other places, you're right. <laughs> okay. um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, evolving consumer trends around the world. You have 187 markets. Um, Obviously, food is very culture bound, and so there are significant differences across and even within these markets. How do you, how do you run a global food enterprise um, when you can't necessarily have standardization of product uh, across the world? Yeah. So to give you a sense of scale, um, the company has about 2,000 brands um, around the world. Um, so about 35 of those are what we call billionaire brands, so more than a billion dollars in sales. Uh, and then you have a long tail end uh, because we also run uh, quite a large number of very local brands that may only have meaning in one particular country market or even in a region uh, of a market. Um, 
And then the total number of uh, products is about 25,000. Uh, so just to give you a sense of the complexity, and that shows you that uh, this is not a one person job to kind of um, oversee that and run that. You really have to break it down into uh, geographic and uh, strategic responsibilities. So the way the company is organized, it's basically uh, the backbone is our geographic organization. We have three geographic zones, uh, the Americas, then Europe, Middle East, and Northern Africa, and then Asia and Oceania and Africa and, um, and the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, inside those geographic zones, you have the markets. And then you have essentially between these three zones and our product categories, you have one giant matrix. So uh, the product categories sort of define the strategies and the geographies execute. Um, Sounds complicated, and yes it is, but again, this is the way how you create a bit of uh, structure and order uh, in a company that vast. Mm -hmm. But can, can you may maybe through a couple of examples, Mark, uh, you know, just highlight some consumer insights that have uh, um, resulted in innovations um, that perhaps have come from unlikely places around the world, but that have yeah traveled through the Nestle network to uh, uh, be very successful uh, new brands that have uh, crossed uh, national boundaries. Yeah, so I have a wonderful example uh, for you that's right on the board behind me and that's KitKat, um, um, our confectionery product. So that um, is a UK product and it came through us uh, through an acquisition we did in the 1980s of uh, Roundtree Macintosh. Uh, iconic product, uh, basically a chocolate covered wafer. And um, for the longest of time, um, the leadership, the thought leadership uh, came from York in, uh, in, in the Northern UK, um, where the, the brand management was domiciled. Um, interestingly, about 20 years ago, um, our brand management in Japan took a special interest in the KitKat product. And so rather than going for very conservative brand extensions, they went funky, okay? So they went into all kinds of flavors, uh, covered products um, and uh, different presentation forms. It, it was all within the boundaries of what we had defined of what KitKat has to be because it always has to be a wafer-based product, but they really stretch it. and. Um, uh, the jargon we use inside the company, they made KitKat cool again, uh, because what happened then is what was originally only to be meant to be a Japanese idea kind of radiated back. And, um, and so many markets outside of Japan uh, copied what they were doing. And so these days we have, you know, a red colored KitKat, a golden colored KitKat, a blue colored KitKat. And um, it, the amazing thing is, in addition to all the consumer interest, it also energized the base product. So in a market where you see some of these interesting variants do well, the base product also does well. And um, so to me, an interesting way of, you know, how a place where no one expected it to be, uh, you know, the source of rejuvenation, uh, how that really took over. And to this day, you know, when we look at KitKat innovation, even though formerly it's domiciled in the UK, it's actually the, the Japanese side that's uh, providing all the innovation. Right. I uh, just want to share that I played a minor role here in as much as uh, uh, I had a job one summer on the production line of the Roundtree Macintosh factory in Norwich uh, in England. Uh, but uh, uh, I was uh, uh, looking after Rolos, uh, not uh, Kit Kats. Um, but uh, I'm, afraid I, I, I'm afraid I suffered a little bit from the uh, Lucille Ball problem on the uh, chocolate production line. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, I, I enjoyed my time with Roundtree Macintosh. You're bringing back memories. Um, so let, let me uh, perhaps switch to the, uh, the COVID crisis uh, for a moment and uh, perhaps uh, remind our audience members that uh, we'll take uh, your questions on the Q&A function. So please uh, start thinking of some good questions for, uh, for Mark. Um, when, when did you become aware of the crisis, um, that it was a crisis, and how did you respond? What were, the what were the sequence of things that you as the CEO had to do 
uh, in February or March of last year uh, to uh, address the issues. Yeah, and I'll be happy to answer that one specifically, but let me also throw it back to you and to the audience. I've been using this quite often now with some of our own uh, executive talents and uh, internal coaching because it's been such a memorable event that it's sometimes good to go back and, and personally ask yourself, when is it with you that the coin dropped, that this was gonna be a complete uh, uh, changing event uh, for the year 2020 and certainly several years beyond. And you know, with some of them that occurred incredibly early and some of them really took a while to, uh, uh, to get it. So when it comes to me, um, initially I saw it mostly uh, as something that hopefully can be contained um, uh, in the Far East. Um, and in February last year, uh, like most of us, I was sitting on the edge of my chair and hoping that it would stay contained. What made the coin drop um, was then at the end of February, uh, a series of uh, pictures that uh, a colleague uh, sent me on my smartphone, and this was store shelves in Northern Italy, where all of a sudden, you know, this outbreak had, you know, gotten known, and then people were really trying to stock up in, in, in a short amount of time. And it was coming from several cities there, so it was not just one, and the immediate message was, look, this is no longer under control. And um, so from there, it was clear to me, okay, uh, this will go worldwide. This is gonna be different than, for example, SARS in 2003. If it does go worldwide, it will have some pretty significant implications. And uh, so from that evening, when I saw the pictures, um, you know, first few emails went out to the entire company, get your stock levels up. Don't even try to sort of guess what is gonna be in demand, everything, please up, up, up because uh, it was clear to me that supply chains were gonna be under stress. Uh, they have stayed under stress until now. And uh, I also expect that to continue for some time in 2021. And then of course, um, we were sitting together and trying to articulate priorities for the entire company. And we came up very quickly with three. Uh, safety first, of course, because only if you stay safe and healthy, you have what it takes to pursue uh, all the next objectives. Um, so we were one of the first companies to release international travel restrictions at the end of February. In fact, when we released them, some, uh, some media criticized us for traumatizing the situation. Um, so lo and behold, we're still not traveling a year later. But um, so I think we made the right call on that one. Um, next was business continuity. So over and above everything I described on inventory levels, um, really scrutinizing your supply chains and trying to um, identify alternative vendors and also inside the factories, being sure that uh, you have the largest possible amount of resilience. And then the third one uh, was um, community support because it was pretty clear to us that while everyone is gonna get impacted from this crisis, we were gonna be doing better than, for example, hotels, restaurants, airlines, anyone in the hospitality space. And so providing a helping hand in a crisis like this, that's so unprecedented to me was, you know, there was not even a question about it. So this goes back to what you asked earlier on culture. I mean, to us, they were trying to be a good citizen in the communities where we're present and uh, the markets where we're present is, um, it, it, it's second nature. And hence uh, that became a priority. And those three priorities, we kind of rolled out inside the company. And I'm proud to say, you know, different people came to different answers in different markets and how best to um, um, implement that. Uh, but that's the strength of a decentralized structure because there's no way of guessing from Switzerland, you know, what exactly it takes to respond to this in China or Australia or South America. All you can do is articulate priorities, provide a few tools, and then locally people had to figure it out. In, in retrospect, is there anything that you would have done differently or earlier um, any, any areas where you, you had to play catch up, as it were? Um, I think overall, we were quite timely. Uh, in hindsight, um, you know, it's an interesting piece of um, um, uh, memory here. Um, one of the first challenges I had to manage as a CEO with my previous company in 2003 was SARS. And so that's why probably for longer time than 
necessary, I thought that this is something that can be uh, limited to just one geography. Uh, maybe I should have been, you know, um, more doubtful on that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, has has uh, the COVID crisis opened up uh, new opportunities, either in terms of uh, product innovation or in terms of uh, uh, process supply chain innovation or uh, um, work uh, habit innovation? Uh, what what do you see as innovations coming out of this uh, that are going to be uh, longer lasting? I think there's um, at a fairly high level, there's two significant changes that are here to stay. Um, one is on all things digital. And so this is not only consumer facing, this is also about the ways we're working, just like we're holding this as a Zoom conference today. And so within a few weeks time, you know, the entire company had to kind of switch to that uh, type of, uh, of working and uh, initially was an emergency response, but now of course it's second nature to all of us. And um, I think that will impact our ways of working uh, in the future. You asked earlier, are we returning to travel? Yes, we will. But will everyone five days a week sort of show up in the office? Uh, no, I think we will probably be more selective about which type of activity requires your presence at a joint place with your colleagues and which type of activity you can do from your home or remotely elsewhere. And um, so I think that change is here to stay and you see one company after another announcing more flexible uh, work rules. And I think our associates will also increasingly demand that. I think you know there, there, there's a convenience to it uh, that um, I think is here to stay. On the consumer facing side, food was one of the last categories to catch the digital wave. and. Um, uh, when you look at categories uh, such as books, think Amazon, or uh, consumer electronics, they were way ahead. On food, I think most people still prefer to pick uh, their products themselves. Um, so the quip we used is you want to check out the bananas before you buy them. Um, and I think now, because of the health concerns, uh, it has been the breakthrough for digital business models. People under the stress of you know, the situation had to try it out, they were happy with what they saw. And I think many of them are gonna be um, staying with uh, digital purchasing uh, for food and beverage. Um, and then the other big one is uh, an increasing concern for um, health. And um, initially, of course, the mantra was, what can I do to boost my immune system? But I think it goes way beyond that. So personal health, uh, I think is something that has seen tremendous appreciation and, uh, and that'll continue as well. Can you just say a little bit more about that in, in terms of how uh, a massive food company like uh, Nestle uh, is going to be able to, to embrace um, personalization? Um, obviously, technology will help, but um, how are you going to be able to do that for tens of millions of Nestle consumers? Yeah. And... Um... The personalization side is one aspect of health. Um, I think there's also a broader aspect that we have been pursuing very steadfastly over the last uh, 20 or so years, and that's simply to get uh, the calories down, get sugar down, uh, salt, saturated fat, and so forth. So that will continue. But you're right, personalization is a major opportunity that I think is enabled by some of the digital business models. Uh, so this old marketer's dream of segment of one marketing, I think these days is possible in, uh, in, in, in some consumer segments. So we have a few examples in our company. Uh, one is, for example, personalized pet food, where um, with a business based in the UK called tails.com, you enter on your smartphone all the details about your dog, uh, age, breed, any um, medical issues, and then out of 15 different ingredients, uh, we mix um, the dog food that's right for this pet. You enter a monthly subscription, and then we send it to your home, even with the name of the pet on the, on the back, and, um, and that's immensely popular. That type of business model would not have been affordable in the pre-digital age. You can really only pull that off uh, with you know, a fully digitalized storefront and also fully digitalized uh, fulfillment. And the interesting thing, when you look at where this is positioned price-wise, it's not even a super premium product. It's, it's sort of sitting somewhere mid-range and, uh, and still, you know, we can pull it off uh, through digital. Okay. 
Um, can you say a little bit uh, about uh, Nestle's commitment in the area of plant-based nutrition? Yeah, so that is another key theme. Um, we have um, a food business uh, that is about 11 billion uh, Swiss francs in revenues. And um, a lot of that, of course, traditionally is based on animal proteins, uh, so meat um, and, uh, and, and, and fish and so forth. And um, I think plant-based um, is an important game changer for that food uh, business in that more and more consumers um, find strong interest in plant-based alternatives. And it is true that our Western diet kind of over-indexes on animal proteins. And so it's not about turning into a radical vegetarian or vegan, it's more about balancing the diet. So, you know, a few times a week, maybe going for the plant-based alternatives as opposed to uh, uh, the real product. And uh, the benefits are twofold. Um, and there's also different reasons why people um, have so much interest. One is health related, uh, because again, for the same amount of protein, you might get away with a lower number of calories, lower fat, lower sodium, what have you. Uh, but then the other one is um, there's also an environmental benefit. So uh, depending on what study you look at, the greenhouse gas burden of, for example, a plant-based burger is 80, 90% less uh, than uh, a beef patty. And um, hence, you know, that's a, that's a major reduction. And do, do remember around the world, um, agriculture contributes about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever we can do in agriculture to get greenhouse gas emissions down um, is going to be uh, very significant. So we have uh, a number of uh, very good questions coming in now over the uh, Q and A function. Um, so one one, one question uh, uh, relates to um, your commitment to uh, water uh, as a um, a service to consumers, uh, Perrier, uh, etc. Uh, but what about the uh, plastic associated with the distribution. Uh, what are you doing further to deal with the uh, concerns around the packaging? Yeah, so packaging is one of our top priorities uh, to make that more sustainable. Uh, we have a commitment now to, uh, to make by 2025, um, all of our um, uh, packaging recyclable or reusable. And, um, Clearly, when it comes to hydration, you need some form of container. But I do think that depending on what geography you're looking at, uh, there may be alternative options uh, in addition to plastic bottles. Um, it's not as simple as switching back to glass because when you think about the sheer weight of a glass bottle and uh, you know shipping that back and forth and cleaning it, um, clearly you're running into some trade-offs when it comes to uh, CO2 emissions. But uh, there's a lot of research underway on alternative containers. And um, we have started our own Institute of Packaging Sciences because we didn't just want to be at the mercy of some of our packaging uh, suppliers. We wanted to keep them on their feet by actually having our own research capabilities in what constitutes better, better packaging. So I very much believe in this um, business opportunity and, and a worthy cause of healthy hydration but I also fully understand and accept that uh, anything uh, we can do here on improving the packaging is gonna be really important. And we're working on this with a lot of effort. Uh, more broadly, can you comment on the initiatives Nestle is taking uh, with respect to climate change? Uh, is, is Nestle a leader in this area? And if, if so, how? Yeah. I do believe in our modesty, uh, we are a leader in that space. And um, so we have been an early supporter of, uh, you know, all the um, initiatives that the, uh, the Paris Agreement uh, stands for. Uh, we have also signed uh, two years ago, the United Nations one and a half degree pledge. Um, let me also say specifically here to the US debate, uh, so at a time when uh, the U.S. was not part of the Paris Agreement, uh, we were also one of the signatories of the We Are Still In movement. Uh, so I'm mentioning that because it's important to be, no matter where the political winds came from, we were pretty steadfast in our commitment here to, uh, to uh, reducing carbon emissions. Uh, the United Nations rules uh, usually give you two years to then come up with a specific plan on how you get to carbon neutrality by 2050. 
Um, we didn't take the full two years. A year later, we came out with a very detailed roadmap in 2020 that is uh, seen as a bit of a benchmark on how to do these roadmaps right. As you can imagine, when you have a 30-year commitment, if you want uh, public credibility, if you want buy-in into such a document, it has to be pretty thoughtful and detailed about how you intend to do this so that your commitment is not just an empty promise. And it also has to have very strict intermediate milestones that you um, uh, want to achieve. Uh, so in our case, uh, we're targeting a 20% reduction of CO2 by 25, a 50% reduction by 2030, and then the balance um, in the 20 years after. Um, as you know, with the climate debate, um, more important than the question whether you're targeting 2040 or 2045 or 2050 is the question, what are you doing the next few years so that you're really bending the curve? And as you can see uh, from that roadmap, uh, we're clearly trying to, uh, to make a significant difference here in that next decade. Okay. Uh, another question here regarding um, agricultural subsidies. Uh, does Nestle have a point of view on this? Um, we don't have a general high level point of view. Um, and uh, look, we're trying to be uh, supportive uh, to the agricultural communities in a lot of different places. And of course, there's very different starting points, uh, be it climate, be it, uh, uh, you know, trading access uh, and, uh, and uh, market access. So uh, there's no one size fits all policy that we have on this on a global scale. Okay. Um Here's an interesting uh, question, a slightly different thrust. Um, were, were you hired to be uh, the voice of continuity uh, or were you brought in as an outsider to um, promote and execute change? And if so, what? It's probably a better question for the board to ask, uh, but uh, let me comment from, from my perspective. I feel that um, there is a lot of good things that um, absolutely deserve respect and continuity at Nestle. There's a lot of this, there's a history of success, a strong culture, as we discussed earlier, uh, that is uh, absolutely worth preserving and taking forward. And so I think uh, when the board interviewed me, um, that humility that I mentioned earlier the willingness to listen first and to appreciate what this company stands for and what it has done in the past and to appreciate its strengths, um, that was an important element. Yet at the same time, when you think back about five years ago, um, the um, consumer goods industry uh, was under um, a bit of stress. I think all the large scale uh, companies uh, had some weaker organic growth levels than let's say 10 years ago. And a lot had to do with the onslaught of small to mid-sized companies that had an amazing rate of innovation and very often digital business models on how to get to the market. And so, yeah, uh, the board wanted to see uh, some of those uh, changes as well. And uh, so continuity on the one hand, and then embracing that change that happened around us and, and catching up with it and leading it, um, I think is no contradiction. What is Nestle doing regarding food waste? So food waste, I think, is one other key lever uh, to reduce um, the environmental burden and greenhouse gas emissions um, around the world. Um, so clearly in the supply chain, when it comes to providing storage facilities and when it comes to you know, being super meticulous now manufacturing to avoid any waste, um, I think we're working hard at this. And then in a global industry association called the Consumer Goods Forum, we are also working very closely uh, with our global retail partners around the world to be sure that um, food waste gets minimized. So absolutely, it's, you know, because we're dealing with so many perishable ingredients and, and, and finished products, um, waste is probably a bigger problem in the food space than in some other industries, and hence it's a big priority. Perhaps a uh, related question. Uh, social justice, does Nestle have any commitment in this area? Look, I think these days people want to see companies um, as a positive contributor to societal progress, and uh, and we're trying to do that. As you know, that's part of our uh, credo uh, of being a good citizen. And um, 
So whether that is, you know, better access for, for example, minority-led suppliers, um, also working with uh, minorities in, in communities, providing training and uh, job opportunities. So yeah, I, I think, you know, this is an agenda that we are very um, uh, forward thinking on. We're taking different answers in different locations because uh, obviously the world is a vast place and uh, societal problems vary a lot depending from um, where you look at. So yeah, it's, um, I think this is increasingly an area where the public holds companies accountable and expects us to do our part. Uh, and we're stepping up to that. Uh, thanks. Is, is uh, Nestle uh, ahead of the curve with respect to new applications of artificial intelligence uh, and robotics in its uh, manufacturing um, plants or in its supply chains uh, and in general um, in the back office of the overall operation? Um, it is a very important area to work on. Uh, can I say with confidence we're ahead of the curve? Uh, probably not. Uh, are we paying a lot of attention to it? Are we with it? Uh, yes. And a few examples. Um, one is, again, the spirit of avoiding uh, unnecessary uh, distribution or waste. Uh, predict predictive demand forecasting. So on waters, for example, um, with the analytics we have today in artificial intelligence, um, based on the weather forecast, you know more or less in the summer months um, where next week's demand is going to be. And so you try to target your shipping in better ways uh, towards that so that the product ends up at the right place um, where you know, the next heat wave, for example, is going to, uh, to, to strike with you know, the largest amount of probability. Um, so that's a demand-led um, uh, side. Um, in our manufacturing, same thing. I think artificial intelligence helps you in a much better way to link the demand side of the house and the uh, manufacturing side of the house uh, and make better decisions there. So lots of initiatives underway, but uh, again, in the spirit of modesty, can I say we're ahead of the curve? Um, I say we're with it. Um, related question, does... Um... What, what has Nestle learned from uh, the uh, COVID crisis um, that would prepare it better for the next pandemic? One of the fascinating um, developments I would point to is what I call uh, remote maintenance. Uh, so think about our manufacturing setup um, with more than 400 uh, factories around the world some of them in pretty remote places in Asia or South America or Africa. And for some of the higher tech equipment, uh, you would have specialists flying around and providing the servicing here. And of course that was no longer possible. And yet those plants needed to be running because um, you know, even in the times of COVID crisis and they were deemed to be essential. And uh, so they had to stay in business. And so with um, augmented reality and, um, and vision goggles and what have you, in a short period of time, we were working out remote maintenance uh, protocols that allowed uh, basically these specialists to guide um, some of the less qualified people locally to perform some of these tasks. And um, obviously, once we saw that that's working, I mean, here's an element where you can provide essentially the same maintenance at a lesser cost and less travel activity. And so, that part um, is, is, is very likely to stay. And so it shows you, you know, in our ways of working, whether it's offices or maintenance, uh, like I just described, I mean, there's so many parts where overcoming this crisis will not mean a return to 2019. I mean, it'll be a rocket start into the 2020s. Uh, China is currently Nestle's second most important market after the US. Uh, when will it become Nestle's number one market? And is that an issue? Look, we are very committed to the China market, just like we are to the US market. Um, at this point, we're still talking about uh, a very meaningful uh, uh, difference in size. So our US activities are around $30 billion, uh, and uh, China's about eight. Uh, but of course, yeah, I mean, 1.3 billion, 1.4 billion people lots of appetite for international brands, international high quality uh, products. So yeah, we are quite uh, optimistic about growth opportunities there. And one of the um, uh, most exciting areas to me is uh, coffee consumption. 
So traditionally, the, uh, the, the per capita coffee consumption in China has been very low, but there's huge interest um, for coffee products. And uh, so you see in that entire country kind of discovering the benefits of coffee and slowly moving from a tea drinking market to coffee drinking market. And for the world's largest um, um, uh, in-home uh, coffee company, you know, that's an exciting opportunity. Are certain Nestle products subject to uh, counterfeiting and uh, gray marketing a cross-border transit of uh, lower priced uh, items from one market into a higher priced market, I think is what the questioner is referring to. Um, can you uh, comment on, on these practices or are they not really that common in the food industry? Look, I think on all branded products, uh, there is uh, the counterfeiting risk. And then, of course, every time you have a pricing differential between uh, some markets, which may have come about due to historic reasons, uh, there is a risk here that there's a great market opening up uh, between uh, two countries. So, yeah, um, that exposure is there and um, you have to be very vigilant. Um, of course, we constantly uh, check out for any uh, counterfeit products and uh, we also, when it comes to um, our demand side, uh, we're trying to be sure that, uh, you know, there's not a vast crane market developing here for our products and, uh, and creating confusion for our consumers. How are you approaching uh, vaccination of your employees around the world? Uh, do you try to, um, do you try to help your employees uh, be vaccinated uh, earlier or uh, do you follow uh, rigorously the market-by-market uh, market guidelines set by regulators? Yeah, so very important question. And uh, let me say, with regards to the entire COVID uh, crisis, uh, one of the sad things uh, that I saw was that at times, very clear health-related beneficial solutions, like wearing a mask or getting your vaccine, were getting politicized, and that is not a good idea. Okay, this is where health and the science needs to reign supreme. And so we were a very early adopter of uh, masks and uh, you know, trying to um, make sure that our associates when they were on our premises had those available. And we're very clear about our recommendations uh, to wear those at all times, uh, even in our personal lives. So of course it's a personal decision, but we wanted to be sure that people understand um, what the company thinks. Uh, same applies to vaccinations. It's a personal choice. We can't force anyone. But um, frankly, uh, the minute uh, my turn in the queue comes up, I'll be very happy to be vaccinated in front of our own people, uh, just to be sure that they understand, you know, uh, this is not something that we only recommend to others. Uh, we're walking the talk. Um, when it comes to making vaccines available, Clearly, that policy, uh, you wait till it's your turn in the line. Um, and I think that is um, uh, important. So, of course, I mean, we'd like to get vaccinated as quickly as possible, but and, and we admire the fact that, you know, the US now has ramped up to a very good speed on doing this. But yeah, uh, most European countries, Switzerland included, and many other markets around the world, um, the wait will still be uh, on for a while. And uh, frankly, the last thing you want to do is seen as taking much needed vaccines away from the people who need it so much more, either because of the age profile or because there may be healthcare frontline workers. Uh, that's, that's not on. Okay. Uh, what, are, what are the most important growth opportunities as you see them, either geography wise or in terms of uh, particular food business lines? Yeah. So in terms of food business lines, um, there is um, uh, uh, coffee, which I discussed earlier, um, where you don't, do not only have the emerging market opportunity, but even in established markets, uh, coffee consumption is still uh, on the rise. And there's also an ongoing amazing premiumization opportunity where people are so much more prepared to um, pay a premium for a new and improved product. And there's so many varieties of coffee that you can serve up, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. The other one that's a major trend uh, from a product point of view is uh, pet food. Um, so here you have kind of uh, a twin engine um, in developed markets, a pet is seen more and more as a fully entitled family member. So people want to do the best for their pet when it comes to nutrition and hence 
again, a major science and premiumization opportunity for us. And then in developing countries, you see that um, pet um, adoptions are still on the rise. And then of course, that whole trend of not feeding a pet anymore with household waste, but rather dedicated pet food is also on the rise. And so if you put all of that together, uh, you really have a wonderful uh, growth profile. And um, so being one of the leading companies in pet food is actually, is, is very important to us. It's also a very nice digital opportunity because every pet owner sooner or later will need some handholding about, you know, a pet question. Um, you know, do they need to go to the vets, yes or no? And so it's a good way to stay in touch in a digital way with pet owners and uh, giving them helpful advice, but also uh, getting the data. Okay. A uh, couple of uh, environmental and sustainability questions as we uh, uh, come up to the top of the hour here. Um, one, one question relates to um, um, bottled water production from uh, which is sourced from springs that uh, become progressively more environmentally fragile with uh, you know low water levels. And wh when that happens, what does Nestle do to mitigate the environmental impact and uh, sustain a healthy ecosystem? Yeah. So this is an area that we call water stewardship, and it is very important to us. And uh, yeah, for most uh, so-called catchment areas or springs, um, you can um, you know, measure exactly what the water table is, what are the contributions that are coming through um, rainfall and the like, and um, you know, what is the leeway of how much you can take out without uh, sort of um, undermining the sustainability of the water uh, table here. And also, of course, we don't want to be seen as taking away water from others. So I think it is an area we take very importantly. Uh, I know that in the US in the past, uh, we had um, uh, some public issues around that. Uh, don't want to take sides here, but let me also say that in some cases, it was not only um, a water issue, but also a community relations issue that uh, you know we, 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 we had to approach in a, in a more constructive way. But it's an area that we take very, very seriously. Um, what about um, the um, leveraging of partners, especially when it comes to meeting the uh, net zero commitment by 2050? Uh, so one of, one of our uh, webinar attendees uh, mentions that um, a tremendous number of uh, trees and uh, landscapes that help absorb carbon uh, are part of the Nestle commitment here uh, over the next 10 years. Will, the question is, will Nestle work with local project partners or, or do this independently? Yeah, look, we will have to work a lot with local project partners. And um, to give you a sense, and this is the challenge with an agricultural products company, 95% of our greenhouse gas emissions, when you include the supply chain, are actually from the supply chain. And the 5% is the rest of the company. So our manufacturing facilities, travel, uh, you know, our buildings, the energy that goes in here. So um, turning that part, the last, that, that 5% in, inside our own four walls, turning that carbon neutral is the easiest part. And everything else upstream is um, basically patient work with our suppliers uh, and providing technical assistance um, uh, you know, articulating your requirements, but also helping them to get there because uh, at the quantities at which we need these products, it's not enough to simply say, I want it this way or that way. Uh, we, need, we need to help um, uh, you know, our farming partners to upgrade uh, their practices over time. And that means involvement in all sorts of uh, joint projects and local projects. And that's also why uh, you know, our carbon neutrality commitment, full scope free, um, is stretching to 2050. Um, uh, we didn't see a path here to accelerate that much beyond uh, to, 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 to an earlier date. Earlier. Okay. Uh, any impact on Nestle from the sewage canal blockage? Well, um, the difficult thing is that uh, worldwide supply chains have been under stress for a year now. And so uh, this was just one other additional problem that made it even worse. But even before that, 
uh, all winter now, uh, con container shipping has been under significant stress. And so this problem made it worse. Uh, fortunately, it only was five days or so, but even in those five days, uh, you had several hundred ships now piling up in a huge uh, traffic jam. So that'll cause delays about when these ships arrive at their port of destination and when they can pick up the return freight. And so you will see some ripple effects from that uh, for probably several months and, and into a situation that was quite uh, under stress already. So yeah, our supply chain folks are um, pretty much working around the clock um, one thing we started last year as part of our uh, COVID preparedness, so we have um, either a weekly or twice a week uh, COVID crisis call where we sort of do a deep dive into these um, supply chain issues. And uh, um, that one is, um, I just came out of one today. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's one that's very significant right now. Hopefully it'll get more relaxed towards the end of the year, but the next few months in supply chain are gonna be a very busy time. Okay. Um, may, maybe the we'll make this the last question to uh, stay on time uh, for you, Mark, and thank you so much for your uh, time with us today. We have a number of students uh, who are with us from uh, uh, various courses at our school, including uh, Professor Major's uh, Management 401 class. And uh, I wonder, uh, what qualities you would suggest that a business school graduate needs to succeed at Nestle uh, today and uh, over the next decade? What, what, what are you looking for uh, when you uh, acquire talent from business schools? Yeah, I think my first advice would be to sit back and do a bit of inspection. Um, what kind of career am I interested in? Am I sort of a large company type? Or am I more interested, for example, in a startup venture or a mid-sized company, family health business? Uh, these days, uh, you have such a broad range of choices um, and you can be phenomenally successful in each and every one of them. Uh, the large companies are not the only game in town. The trade-off essentially when you join a large firm is um, on the one hand, you have unparalleled reach in what you want to do. So, you know, our carbon roadmap moves the world so much more than a small business's uh, carbon roadmap, for example. But um, it also, as you can imagine, with the scale and size, and when I was describing our company structures earlier, it takes more patience um, on the part of the participating executive to discuss and align and agree these things. And um, you, as a person, you need to have that attention span and patience if you want to be successful in this environment. It doesn't mean slow. It just means the willingness to compromise, the willingness to listen to, from the other side, um, uh, what their contribution is, and then constructively working out something that uh, you know, makes sense for the entire corporation. To me, um, that kind of inspection, do I want to go for a large company career or do I want to go for something else is the starting point. And then um, when you join us, uh, be prepared to make it a mid to longer term career. Uh, I think uh, there's a value here that accrues over time from harmony when it comes to your values, the culture, knowing your colleagues, knowing where people come from. Um, it's important not to look at your career only in let's say two or three year increments. Um, a lot of resumes out there where uh, someone may apply and you see they kind of hop from one opportunity to another but never sort of stayed through a challenge and a challenging time, which I think everyone in their career has had that. And, uh, do you face it together and get through it, or do you run away from it? Uh, changing jobs is easier than ever, but uh, staying power, I think, is something that um, is highly valued. Mark, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Uh, we uh, had a huge number of questions. I was not able to get to all of them, but thank you to our audience members for uh, volunteering so many good questions, and uh, uh, we wish you uh, every success in the role at Nestle, and uh, uh, always uh, look forward to enjoying uh, Nestle products. So th thank you for uh, what you do for the world every day and uh, also your 300,000 employees. John, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on the program. And uh, thank you for everyone who joined. Thanks for your interest in the company. And uh, yes, enjoy your Nestle Nest product. Okay. All the very Thanks, best. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon from Miami. Thank you.